Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Midwifery Wisdom Reacts. The awesome trio is here again <laughs> to watch um, a little bit more of a serious toned video. Trigger warning, we, the topic of hemorrhaging and a video portraying a mother who experiences hemorrhaging is discussed. So be prepared for that. But we do have a really awesome conversation about changes that need to happen in the world and about information about hemorrhaging in general. So we're excited. Yeah, so yeah. glad to be here. Um, if you like this content, please hit the thumbs up. Also hit subscribe button and drop us a comment. What do you like? What do you want to see more of? And if you have a video on YouTube that you really want us to react to, uh, send us the link. We, we're always looking for good info. All right, let's jump into it. Deep breaths. That's really nitrous, Hello. nitrous oxide, Hello. the UK mom's best friend. Yeah. <laughs> oxide reading about your very complex history. Yeah. <laughs> oh, complex history. It took us three years to become pregnant with our first. Unfortunately, at 25 weeks, I went into premature labor. We had hope. Not this one. Hope. Okay. The survival rate is good, but the delivery wasn't smooth. They managed to get her out and um, she had stopped breathing. Um, so they spent, I think, was about 15 minutes bring, resuscitating. The neonatal baby just just came out and told us, it's time to hold your daughter because she's going to pass. So this is a rainbow baby for them. I mm -hmm. helped her. And um, yeah, she passed away in my arms. <laughs> All right. Is that one gone? Done. All right. Yeah. Be as quick as we can. All right. Yes. Because of Sammy's leukemia as a child, she always has a higher risk in pregnancy because of her platelets, they're always a little bit lower, so therefore she is more of a risk to hemorrhage. I'm gonna get you to go towards me, over the back of the bed, okay? Oh my gosh, I don't know. You don't know about this? So it helps bring baby in the right place, I know. Midwives in other countries are so great at helping mamas get into positions that help progress. Oh man, I remember switching positions when you're like, Pretty you actively go in. in she is roaring her baby out. Oh, yes, yeah, she is. So, even though she's high risk, her midwife is still doing the delivery, which I love. Well done. That's and in a great hands and knees position. So which awesome. Is awesome. Baby's here. Oh, my God. Don't panic, please. Oh, God. Oh, Did she just tell her mom okay. to not panic? Right. Yes. <laughs> just want the baby. Yeah. Is the baby okay? Severe blood loss is terrifying, to be honest, because it can be so rapid and so dramatic and so sick. Yeah. Grandma maybe should not have been in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Ever since Sammy's illness as a child, the fear of losing her always mm. stayed with me oh, up to this yeah. day. All I just need to do is take you into theatre yeah. to examine you. You probably off to sleep, probably. Uh -huh. And then we're going to need to put a big catheter. Works this great. is not taken lightly. Like, uh, we don't, worst comes to worst. We don't so consider we'll moms to, we'll out of their birthing room and that. separate from their baby and unconscious unless something's okay, really happening. Okay. I'm so impressed with how he's talking to her. I know, me too, me too. In, in the definition of hemorrhage has always been a little bit convoluted. Um, so for a long time, the definition was 500 milliliters, um, 500 cc's, same measurement, um, after a vaginal birth and 1,000 after a cesarean. But 500 was also the definition of average blood loss. 
So about uh, two years ago, ACOG came out with a new definition, which was a flat thousand milliliters of blood loss is a hemorrhage no matter how the person is births, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you can know, um, we talk about, when we talk about hemorrhage, we're actually talking about um, hypovolemic shock when they lose too much blood and their body goes into shock. And this can actually happen after a car accident or injury of some kind when you're losing blood, right? So we all know um, from movies and even just common sense, if you came across someone whose leg was bleeding, you would put pressure on the bleeding spot to stop the bleeding because the body will clot at the place of injury and the bleeding will stop and the body will become homeostatic and normalize. The same is true after childbirth. The only challenge is, is that the place that's bleeding is deep inside the uterus in the center of the body. So we have to put pressure on that and we can do it sometimes externally. The body does it naturally with its own contractions postpartum, um, but sometimes we actually need to do it internally. So one hand pushes pressure on the inside and one hand on the outside of the uterus. And it sounds really gruesome, but it's exactly what you would do if someone's leg or arm was bleeding. You put pressure from both sides, right? That's what a tourniquet is about. Mm -hmm. So what he's talking about there when he says the balloon in the show is they've created the same function of a tourniquet on a leg in the uterus, but instead of uh, tightening from the outside, they actually push from the inside. Because if you, if you have natural oxytocin on board or you give pharmaceutical um, pitocin, the uterus contracts. And the balloon inside puts the other side of pressure on the bleeding spot. So it's called um, a cook catheter. I'm sorry, that's very different. It's called balloon. a, a, a bakery yeah. balloon or a Foley catheter. Sometimes they use in the uterus. Um, and the, the bakery balloon puts pressure on the inside of the uterus and the uterine contraction puts pressure on the outside of the uterus. And that is effectively what they think will mm -hmm. stop the bleeding. Um, I'm assuming she had um, Pitocin in her IV drip already, and that's not working. So that's where they're moving to this next stage. And she would have lost a thousand already or more for them to even consider the shift is my hunch. Um, and I've seen torrential hemorrhage. I've seen a lot of hemorrhages, but the ones that really stick with you are the ones that are like a faucet where you can hear the water running out of her body. And, um, you know, when you, when someone loses a thousand cc's in three minutes. Um, it's, it's a totally life-threatening emergency situation. And so a lot of people have paranoia and terror are terrified about this happening out of the hospital. And so I just want to go back to our very foundation of midwifery care, which is risk assessment. This person, because of her history, is probably not appropriate for community-based birth. Right. People with histories of massive hemorrhage, people with clotting disorders, people with high blood pressure, people with preeclampsia, things like this that cause the increase the risk of bleeding are not appropriate for community-based birth. They do need to birth in a technological environment with an operating room across the hall. So it's really important that when we talk about the safety of home birth or we talk about the risk of hemorrhage, we're not just talking about in the moment, we're talking about the whole course of care, the whole pregnancy and the person's history. And that comes together and the midwife's own skill level to evaluate this potential risk. Um, and so risk assessment and actually risking people out who are not appropriate is one of the most important primary skills of community-based midwifery. Um, but even, even with all good risk assessment, 5% of low risk people bleed. They bleed too much. So everyone bleeds postpartum but it's an appropriate amount because the uterus clamps around the open vessels. But when we bleed too much, uh, midwives need to have a plan for that 5% non-risk assessed hemorrhage. And the first plan is obviously to carry antihemorrhagic so that we can cause the uterus to contract because uterine acne or softness of the uterus postpartum is the most common cause of hemorrhage. So midwives, some carry herbs, um, some plan on doing uterine massage, and most carry antihemorrhagic pharmaceuticals, Pitocin being the most effective and primary, and then methogen and Cytotec being backup options. Midwives also need to be practiced and skilled at something called bimanual compression. Bimanual compression is what they're doing with the Bakri balloon, but this would be with hands. So one hand actually goes in on the cervix and the other hand goes and wraps the uterus around the internal hand. And this pressure creates that, that tourniquet effect so that they stop bleeding. To be effective, by manual compression must last for at least 10 minutes because that's how long it takes for blood to clot. 
So before you take your hands out after doing bimanual, you have to make sure there are clots on the floor from where she was bleeding. If there are not any visible clots, if it's still liquid everywhere where she had bled, do not take your hands out and you have to transport in that position up on the gurney with her with your hands pressing on her uterus because you've likely diagnosed a very rare blood clotting disorder. Yeah. So a lot of midwives understand the theory of bimanual, but they don't actually do it in practice. So in our live skills workshops, and we have one coming up this November called Skills and Drills in Galveston, Texas, in our live skills workshops, we actually set a timer on our mannequin models where the midwives practice holding that for 10 minutes. And it is hard. Your arms tire your back hurts from leaning over. You need sometimes support from your team to even withstand that position. So sometimes we have midwives come behind and hold the midwife's elbows. Sometimes we have them hold their body back so they're not gonna you know, waste their back energy. Uh, but it takes, it takes a lot of energy. And if you take your hands out before 10 minutes, you have eliminated the benefit because they start bleeding again and you have to restart that clotting process. So 10 minutes is the minimum for holding by manual. And we have to make sure there's clots first. Um, once the uterus has clotted and the bleeding has stopped, we can go back to managing them just like we normally do postpartum because that's all that happens in a normal process is that the open vessels clot, the uterus is tight and firm and holds that tension and the woman stops bleeding. So hemorrhage is a huge topic, but it is absolutely possible to manage even out of the hospital with good risk assessment and good skills. And um, in this situation, I think we saw a more extreme version, but it is good to think about. We can calculate how much uh, blood the person lost uh, by weighing and measuring or even estimating on the blood that comes out of them. It's called blood loss estimation. That, that weighing and measuring of the blood can actually give us a real number. Um, also, there's a way retroactively to test her hemoglobin postpartum and do the calculation, and there's a link on our website under the resources section, midwiferywisdom.com. You can do the calculation retroactively at how many hours postpartum she is and what her hemoglobin is to figure out, based on her last hemoglobin, how much blood she lost postpartum, which is always an interesting exercise. Mm. But essentially, everyone loses um, some blood postpartum, sometimes a few drops, sometimes five or 600 cc's is normal. But once we move into the hemorrhage category, we have to take action right away because hemorrhage is a positive feedback mechanism. The more it happens, the more it happens. So we have to stop it. We have to do interventions to keep those moms safe. And hemorrhage or hypovolemic shock is based on four categories, class one, two, three, and four. Class one is called compensated shock. So we just bleed a little bit, the body handles it and it stops. And this just needs natural support, uh, keeping the mom warm, keep talking to them kindly, touching them with respect, explaining what's going on. Um, we need to help that uterus contract. So usually just nursing a baby is enough because the, the breastfeeding releases oxytocin, the natural way to stop contractions. Um, sometimes we use antihemorrhagics or um, herbs. Um, we keep them warm again. Um, and usually that's enough. They can breathe oxygen if they're feeling faint, but that's very rare. When we move into class two, all the symptoms increase. So the, the blood pressure drops, the pulse goes up, they start to feel sweaty or clammy or uncomfortable. They can even gray out or their vision starts to change. They, their hearing can change. Um, this is all a lack of, of blood to the brain is what causes these changes. And this needs treatment immediately. And in a class two hemorrhage, um, the, the person is losing um, uh, into that, that next level of blood loss, which um, we call 15 15 to 30%. Um, and uh, class two hemorrhage uh, is significant because without stopping it, it moves on to the next. And again, this is progressive. Once you get into a class three hemorrhage, it's absolutely life-threatening. This person has lost more than 30% of their blood volume and without immediate help, like blood products in a transfusion, they will likely uh, be at risk of end organ damage or even uh, death. So class four is the one where usually we don't come back from. A class four hemorrhage is when we've lost more than 40% of our blood volume. Um, and when you lose so much blood volume, you're at risk of DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, where the, the blood starts to microclot and damages organs. Also, when you have that little blood flow to your organs, because remember, it's trying to keep blood in your brain, um, we have damage, long-lasting damage. Uh, midwives, this is why, this is why mom 
traumas end up in ICU for, for days and weeks postpartum and sometimes end up with colostomy bags or, you know, you know, kidney transplant, things like this postpartum is because they had so much lack of blood flow to vital organs for so long that they had damage. So at all costs, we, we do not want to have someone at home who has crossed that 30% blood, blood loss uh, threshold. Um, and so uh, we don't carry blood products out of the hospital. That's, that's impossible. It's a, it's a too complicated of a thing. So, but we do carry IV fluids. So replacing the lost fluid is very, very important to stabilize the mama. And midwives, most reputable midwives carry IV fluids and have IV skills. And, um, and they can stop that bleeding and then replace the lost blood volume. And I can honestly say um, that, that, um, that I have... I've been able to stop and control all hemorrhages that I've been a part of. And I know that sounds like quite um, outlandish claims, but it's actually true. I have statistics for my whole career and um, this is how I teach midwives. And I think everyone can be this way. Now, not everyone stays home. Sometimes right. we stop the hemorrhage to a point where they need a blood transfusion. They need more concern at help postpartum. But with bimanual compression, antihemorrhagic pharmaceuticals, IV fluids, and the, the good labor ma or uh, postpartum management, we can stop the hemorrhage and transport on time. Now, if I just do enough numbers, I'll eventually come to that rare condition where we have um, someone with a blood clotting disorder. But even then, as long as you stop the place of bleeding with that bimanual compression, they shouldn't uh, bleed out. So um, hemorrhage management, vitally important. Risk assessment being the foundation of midwifery care, vitally important. Um, and I just want to you know, I just wanted to debunk some of the myths so that mamas out there who are planning a home birth really get that hemorrhage is a risk factor, but it's not, it's not as scary as, as it's been made out to be in many shows and, and videos. Oh, poor thing. Yeah, you can see the blood sheets. I lost nearly three liters of blood, so it was quite a lot. When I was in theater, they put a balloon to add pressure to stop the bleed. And luckily that was successful. So I didn't need to have the hysterectomy. So that's the end result of a really <laughs> tremendous hemorrhage. Yeah, if, if they can't stop the uterus, if they can't get it to contract, Beautiful. it's just gonna openly bleed. So they have to remove the uterus. So that's a very extreme reaction to a hemorrhage. Oh. Um, oh, it shouldn't be very so, common. That I know. Be so traumatizing. It would be so traumatizing. Um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be very common, uh, but it is a life-saving technique. Mm -hmm. I hemorrhage, so. I yeah, mean, do you need Pitocin each time? I don't know what, I would have to ask exactly what she's given me, but I get a shot in my leg yeah. and drink a tincture and some sort of pill up my butt. So. Yeah. Oh, you side get attack all too. of it. Yeah. High five. <laughs> yeah, you definitely hemorrhage. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, I'm mom... glad that you've got a skilled midwife who takes care yeah. of you. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, well, husband... since we're on this topic, can I ask you a quick on the record conversation? Yeah. Me? Um, since you've experienced two hemorrhages, what does it feel like to have your midwife working quickly and telling you what to do postpartum? Um, safe, I guess is mm -hmm. the best word I can think of. I, and, and this is something we talked a lot about. I don't, mm -hmm. I'm curious, Augustine, to hear what you have to say about this. Um, but my midwife has experienced that redheads bleed more. I know it's a serious debate in midwifery. I don't yeah. personally ascribe to this philosophy, but yeah. I know many do. I have two sister-in-laws who are redheads that my midwife sister-in-law has treated and they both hemorrhage as well. My mom also mm -hmm. had an experience of hemorrhaging with the baby. So we didn't know if I would or wouldn't, but we were prepared. And when I had my baby and I started hemorrhaging, we knew exactly what to do right away. And it was not a scramble. It was not a freak out mm. moment. It was here's your tincture, drink this. I'm going to give you this shot. I'm going to put this pill in. And it huh. was never a moment. It was that's, that's how skilled I, midwives work. Yeah. yeah. But so did you actually hemorrhage? I don't think my first, I really did too much. My second, I remember feeling lots of clots and things coming out and seeing them like removing the check pad and putting down a new one that I did feel nervous during that one because I saw more of it. Hmm. I, my will you one, call your midwife and find out what she wrote down for your actual yeah. blood loss number? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Cause it kind of sounds like she was really like proactive, um, proactive yeah. and yeah. And, like gave you the Pitocin and the miso and the, and the tea Just in case. because you knew that mm -hmm. it was popular possible. in your family and yeah. possible. Um, but you may not have. Yeah. Which, 
interesting, this may perpetuate the redhead hemorrhage thing because you may not have hemorrhaged. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I'll have to ask her then. Because I remember with my second, I remember being like, uh, Sarah, Sarah, when I was like yeah. seeing all this blood, she's like, you're okay. You're okay. Mm-hmm. Which maybe that's just like, you know, you're okay. What we say. <laughs> I'm rich and, <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> maybe that's just what we say. Yeah. Well, um, I would say what I tell all midwifery students is there's absolutely zero benefit to bleeding. It doesn't help you. It doesn't help your lactation. It doesn't help your iron levels. It doesn't help your baby. There's zero benefit. So there's nothing wrong with being proactive. And in fact, the very most proactive form of preemptively or proactively treating a hemorrhage is called active management where you don't even wait for any bleeding. And as soon as the, actually the anterior shoulder delivers, you give a shot of Pitocin or you run it through the IV. And then you do controlled cord traction to deliver the placenta within five or 10 minutes. And um, this active management is used by OBs frequently and some midwives. And I think it's very appropriate for high-risk people or for high-risk populations uh, because it is very, very effective at reducing bleeding. Um, I think should it be applied to everyone everywhere? No, I think that's too interventive. I think midwives still should do that risk assessment initially. But, you know, like sounds like your midwife was very on it yeah. and mm-hmm. helped you not experience a torrential hemorrhage. Because when you bleed too much and you have someone's hand in your uterus or you transport for antibiotics or a blood transfusion, I mean, that's a bigger intervention yeah. than drinking some tincture and getting a shot in your thigh. Like I yeah. promise that's worse. I'll take you know? the tincture any day. <laughs> yeah, totally. Exactly. So preactive, proactive um, uh, treatment of, of, of someone who you think is going to bleed too much or is bleeding more than you like is totally appropriate. Like we should not mm-hmm. ever wait and see with bleeding. <laughs> that's never a good plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your story, Becca. Yeah. Well, what an interesting uh, video, and I know that family feels very, very lucky and grateful for their, their beautiful baby and, and making it through that process. How scary. Yeah. And I guess I just want to finish by saying um, that's why obstetrics was invented. That's why we need to find the balance and celebrate that care when it's needed and stop using it when it's not needed. So glad that we talked about this. I think, um, you know, exploring hemorrhage is a big part of preparing for birth. So hopefully that was helpful. And for the midwives out there, and especially student midwives, we have a very exciting skills workshop coming up in November. So check out our website, midwifrywisdom.com. Thanks, everyone. See you on the next one. Bye.